A dispatch from Terra Incognita. Terra Incognita is Latin for unknown land, and I'll be discussing an article I wrote called A Dispatch from Terra Incognita. First, a few ideas from previous videos to set the stage. In this video over here, we talked about component entity, relative existence, dependent existence, and ground of existence. And those four concepts apply to the world that we live in, the, the universe, the world of space-time. And there were corresponding concepts, a simple entity that has absolute existence, that has independent existence, and the ultimate ground of existence. And this is more or less corresponds to I, our idea of God. In this video, we talked about the real with a small r and the real with a capital R. The real with the small r is again the things of this world, which are all transitory. They're real, but they are not uh, eternal. They come and they go. And in contrast, we hypothesize something called the real, which again is our equivalent of God, and that doesn't come and go. That's permanent. And we could make this correspondence that these concepts uh, refer to the real small r, our universe, and these concepts refer to the real capital R. We also talked about the dream analogy. The idea is when I dream, if I dream of a car I had in college, that car that I dream of is not made of metal and steel, it's made of my thought. And also in the dream, if there's my 20-year-old college self, that person is also made of my thought, my mind stuff. And the idea is that if we liken reality to a dream, then the ultimate ground of existence is the dream, or we could call it universal mind. And in this viewpoint, the external world, including my external self, my ego, is part of the dream. Okay, these are concepts we've spoken about, but so what? People can debate philosophical concepts all day, but do they matter? That's the question. So do, I, do ideas like the real, universal mind, ultimate ground of existence have any practical real-world consequences? That's the question that this article addresses. So now we'll go through this article with some comments. It begins like this. I walk down a street on a cool fall day in Pennsylvania and I am walking past homes and trees which are stationary. I'm the one that's moving. Now that might seem obvious, but it will be relevant in a minute. So I feel that the external world is primary and I'm in it. I'm a part of the external world, a small part. The planet has billions of people and I'm just one. And we'll call this the exterior view. In other words, I'm picturing myself in the external world. Now we can talk about an interior view that's not real but virtual. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Now suppose I'm sitting on a sofa and I'm watching this scene on a TV screen. So now I'm stationary and the trees and the homes are moving on the TV. They're moving towards me. This is kind of a reverse of a previous situation. If I'm immersed in the movie and I identify, say, with the detective who's about to open the door, Will he find a suitcase with the missing money? Will he find the villain with a gun? I feel what the detective feels. I identify with him. Here, in this situation, I'm primary. The TV movie is a part of my consciousness. There's other parts of my consciousness. I'm aware I'm sitting on the sofa, and I'm aware maybe it's time for lunch. So this is an interior view. I'm looking out at the world, and I might even be looking out at myself, at my ego if I identify with the detective in the, in the movie. Now let's go to the genuine interior world. This occurs for me once in a while when I'm in a meditative state. So I feel like I'm walking, but I feel, actually, I feel that the world is out there and my ego is out there, and that's all moving towards me. I feel established in my center. So when I walk down the street, it appears that the street and the trees are passing me by as if I'm in a movie when I'm in this state. 
And if I see myself as a character in the movie, like the detective, I experience the action of a man walking down the street from the inside. I feel like I'm stationary, I'm watching myself, my external self, my ego, my body, walking down the street. And doing such times, I feel as if I've returned home. I feel as if I've left the external world, I've kind of stepped back from it, from the external world of places and things, and even I've left my own ego, my own self, my own external self. And at these times, I often feel peaceful and closer to God than when I'm with my normal self. This, to me, is a type of detachment, or non-attachment, as it's also called. And some religions seem to recommend such detachment as a desirable goal. Uh, Buddha said that the root of suffering is, at is attachment. And the Buddha's view is that detachment is a way to cope with the fact of disease, old age, and our eventual death. In the Hindu tradition, there's a uh, recommendation of non-attachment and renunciation is, re is recommended by some Hindu groups. And the teachings of Jesus to turn the other cheek and forgive 70 times 7 can be regarded as putting detachment from the external world into practice. This detachment of ego I want to drill into. I want to talk about it a bit more. There's an idea in uh, Hinduism, I believe, that uh, this is this image of two birds. And one bird looks out on the world, eats the fruits of the world, and the other bird looks on. So the first bird is our individual self, our ego, feeding on the pleasures and pains of the world, feeding on the sensations of the world. And the other is our universal self, that silent inner witness. And so we could say that the first bird in this image uh, corresponds to our ego, and the second one corresponds to the real, or at least our consciousness, which we think of as being close to the real, if not identical with it. To emphasize their detachment from their ego, some mystics refer to themselves in the third person. For instance, um, Swami Rama Tur Turta uh, referred to himself such as the, uh, in that way. In his book, for instance, he's saying here, uh, Rama says, well, that he means himself. Evelyn Underhill in our classic book, uh, Mysticism, a Study in the Nature and Development of Spiritual Consciousness, says that the Christian mystic Suso usually spoke of himself in this way. And here's Suso, and here's a, here's a quote from uh, Evelyn Underhill's book. On a certain day, a heavenly messenger appealed to him and ordered him in God's name to continue no more. Now to him is Suso referring to himself in the third person. He doesn't say, I at once ceased. He says, he at once ceased. The way I understand it is he's talking about his ego, and that's part of the world, but there's a deeper self. He might have thought of it something, thought of it somehow differently. Again, his sufferings, his irons, his nails, his hair shirts. Now, those were instruments of uh, penance in the medieval Christianity. They could be viewed as a, in a secular viewpoint, as a kind of self-torture. And it was used in Christianity either to uh, make penance for your sins or to mortify your body. And that kind of makes me pause. I mean, you see, I'm doing this meditative exercise, or it's happening sometimes. I can't say I just bring it on at will. And there are people who talk about non-attachment and all, and this one mystic uh, used to torture himself until he decided to give it up. So it makes me wonder if this is a wholesome practice. Is it a healthy practice? And that's what I mean by terra incognita. I'm in a, a, a part where perhaps spiritual people have talked about this state, but I'll have to look and find it because I, I, I'm not so sure that I know anything right now that refers to it. So is this state beneficial or not? That's the question. And there's an experience called depersonalization experience, a disassociative experience where someone feels disconnected from their thoughts, emotions, body, or actions. And that seems to describe the state I've been talking about. Here's uh, what the Mayo Clinic says, depersonalization, derealization disorder occurs when you always or often feel that you're seeing yourself from outside your body or sense that things around you are not real or both. Well, that's what I was talking about. 
these feelings can be disturbing. You may feel like you're living in a dream. Well, they don't, um, I, I feel a bit worried about them now, but at the time they don't feel disturbing. And I did use the dream analogy. So a lot of this seems similar to what I'm talking about. Many people have a passing experience, but when they don't go away and make it hard for you to function, it's depersonalization, derealization disorder. And we're gonna drill down on this in the next slide. This is from another site, not the Mayo Clinic. And the first three I do, but does apply to my experience, it does apply to my experience somewhat. See, it seems that I'm observing my thoughts and my feelings from outside myself. Bingo, yes, that is the way it feels. There may be a sense that your limbs are distorted or enlarged or shrunken. Well, I sometimes feel that my body is kind of something I experience rather than me, like my arms are hanging and swinging, just like uh, if I were carrying a bag and that was swinging. Feel like you're in a dream world. Yeah, yeah. Reality doesn't seem real. Well, the exterior world doesn't seem real. Whether that's reality, that's reality with a small r, but anyway. So for the first three, uh, they are somewhat descriptive of what I experience. Now the last four aren't, that's why they're in gray. I don't feel like a robot. I feel somewhat passive in that watching what's going on out there, but I wouldn't call it a robot. Um, the anxiety, is, as you say, comes afterwards when I think, hey, this feels good, but is it good? Or is it going to lead me somewhere bad? Feeling that I'm not in control of myself? No, I don't have that feeling. And uh, my memories are not my own? No, not at all. So the experience I'm feeling has some overlap, some intersection with depersonalization, but it's not a 100% overlap, hardly. And I find experience uplifting in a way. It doesn't seem to impact the ability of, my, of, of me to function in the world. Now, I'm retired, and I'm in my mid-70s, and maybe if I were uh, at the stage of working and supporting a family, maybe uh, this would interfere. I don't know. So, um, here again. This is an uh, Islamic uh, mystic, I believe. Detachment is not something you should, is not that you should own nothing, but that nothing should own you. He's being... Uh, speaking of detachment in a favorable way. Here again, the last words of the Buddha, all compound things are subject to decay. We talked about compound objects above. Strive with diligence. Now, I say here that uh, it doesn't seem to impact my ability to function in the world. Besides, the prospect of death is, is there. I'm 76. My father and my father-in-law lived to about 82, maybe I live to 86 or 96, but it's coming sooner or later. One day I'll leave this external world in this body. This experience seems to be a reasonable way to prepare for that. I'm kind of leaving the external world in the body partially, and that maybe that's a good idea to prepare for death. So I persist in this pr practice, but I'm, I, I'm cautious at the same time. Um, I, I don't want to get myself into trouble. In a worst case, well, I'd suffer a complete uh, loss of my mental faculties. It would lead me to drive me nuts. The philosopher Nietzsche went uh, insane at the end of his life. I, I, I don't know why. I think there's various speculations. Well, on the other hand, perhaps this would lead me to some sort of enlightenment experience that'll be beneficial. Or maybe it'll just end with a whimper. Like, maybe it'll just sound like, yeah, it didn't make, make much difference to me one way or the other. So, I'm calling this a dispatch or a report from Terra Incognita. It's a little melodramatic, but it's a good title, I think. So, I want to reflect a bit on all this. In the ancient world, philosophy could be transformative. The Meditations by the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius is a collection of Stoic maxims that he practiced, that he attempted to live his life by. Um, there was a man named Bothius. He was executed by a barbarian king. This happened around five or six hundreds. And he wrote a famous book where he has a talk with philosophy, who he personifies as a woman. And he is about to die, and he's looking for comfort and insight and accepting a way to accept his coming execution, and just looking to philosophy for that. So in this channel, 
we have many ideas. I've, I've, I, I have uh, this idea, which we saw, all of these, which we saw earlier. And the point is that this practice, this meditative practice, seems to put these ideas into my life. And I, I like that. I, 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 I wouldn't want this channel to be just ideas that people discuss and whatever. I'd like it to be transformative. And I think that this practice might be transformative. It seems appropriate that a transformative practice would involve risk. So right now I feel like I accept the risk and I want to continue. And the goal of this channel or the, what I'm trying to reach is a closer relationship with the real, with the ultimate ground of existence, which whatever you want to call it, the one. So I'm on the road. I'm on the road. And I want to thank you for watching. Here's my website. If you point your phone at that QR code, it'll take you there. And finally, here's a credit for the music we've been using. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and thanks again.